All right, and we've just hit the magic, the magic time. So I'd like to start off by welcoming our uh, online people. And it seems like every time we, we mention this, we get a few more emails. But uh, if anybody's not getting our weekly email updates uh, via you that are watching us on YouTube, please send us an email and let us know, and we'd be happy to add you. I added about nine or ten people since our last class, and Gary did the same. Uh, so any any questions? We like to start off that way, either on the material for today or anything from the past. And if not, we'll go ahead and jump in. We're going to be doing this chapter in two parts because there's an awful lot of material on it. The lion's share of the material for next week is going to be on amateur TV. And uh, that that's real interesting if you've never done it. So, uh, but there's a lot of pool questions in that area. Wow. So we'll... Uh, We'll keep rolling here. So these are some of the people that have helped us out. And you wouldn't believe how helpful the comments from our students have been. Laptop. Uh, laptop. Mm -hmm. Say again? Yeah. Oh, all right. They're back there uh, talking techie stuff. I thought they were trying to talk to me. So uh, yeah, comments from students. A couple people have caught errors, which we very much appreciate. And uh, a lot of times people have suggestions for pool questions. We'll be sharing some of those this evening. Uh, so that when you multiply the creativity am amongst the group, we come up with a lot of good ideas. And of course, Dave Kassler has been very helpful and gave us permission to use uh, his, his graphics. Haven't used a lot of them, but uh, the ones that we have have been, been really good. And of course, a lot of our core materials from the ARRL. Well, this is what we're going to get into tonight, em emission designators. There's nothing on the, there's, there aren't any pool questions there, so that's going to be real fast. We'll just touch it and move on. Frequency and phase modulation, if you read the book, you probably came away pretty confused, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll be going through some, um, some of that detail here, and then um, I've, I've got some tips and techniques to help us survive that. And then multiplexing is also very interesting. I've got a creative analogy that I think will be helpful for us. So emission designators, uh, it's in, in our book. And it used to be, and Kassler had, a, had some of his uh, old logbooks that he showed, we used to have to actually write down the emission designators when we were uh, putting things in our amateur log, which used to be actually required. Get my pointer going here. So these are related to the International Telecommunications Unit and uh, Union. And it's all, this, this stuff is in the FCC rules as well. Uh, we just refer to modes as FSK, RTTY, rather than try to remember F1B or A1A or any of that. We just, just call it CW. So that's really all, all we're going to talk about here, just an awareness that they exist and they're in the FCC rules. So the book, uh, excuse me, uh, Dave, the book I wrote, Emission Types Equals Modes Equals Emission Designators, but yeah. that's not really true, is it? Well, for, from the practical hand point of view, we just call it modes. We just, it's either CW or single sideband, and that's pretty much all we worry about. But that has yeah. root, roots that go way beyond that in okay. both technology and in, uh, in law. Uh -huh. So we're going to be talking about modulation systems first. And this one that I put last, frequency and phase modulation are forms of angle modulation. The only reason that I put that in there is because one of the pool questions references uh, angle modulation. And if you realize that that's either frequency or phase modulation, which are pretty much the same thing, um, just equate that with angle modulation, that, that question won't confuse you. And then, of course, we've got amplitude modulation that we'll just touch on. But the whole idea is getting information into the radio, send it across the country, and then demodulating it, getting it back out again. That's the idea of modulation systems. So and it's the same as FM or phase? Yeah, FM and phase modulation are pretty much the same thing. Um, they're created differently, and we'll talk about that again. Uh, we have in the past. And then uh, amplitude. So here we've got a, a signal. This might be speech, or let's say it's a thousand cycle tone from a signal generator that you're putting into your transmitter. And this is what AM looks like. 
You see that the amplitude is changing in accordance with the signal coming in. Then with FM or PM, you can see that the frequency is changing. See these little humps are getting closer. And in this, in this case, they're tracking. So with the, the peak of the signal waveform, we see that the, these bumps are scrunching together or we're increasing the frequency. And conversely, during the troughs of the signal, the frequency is actually going lower, which is why these are stretching apart. We'll touch this, get into this a little bit more as we continue. So frequency or phase modulation, what we're actually doing is varying the modulating or varying the frequency. So if we were at 29.6 megahertz, for example, we would be varying uh, above and below that frequency, tracking the audio that we're using to modulate the, the transmitter. And there's something magic about uh, 29 megahertz that we're going to talk about in a bit. We're going to be talking about two concepts, deviation ratio and modulation index. Uh, they're somewhat similar, but uh, it can be very confusing trying to get them all sorted out. The good news is we'll just have a couple of definitions we'll need to remember. I'll give you some tips for that. And then the calculations that are involved are extremely easy. So how much we change frequency, if we keep using the 29.6 megahertz, which is in the 10 meter band, how far the frequency moves from that center frequency is uh, determined by how loud you're talking. So if I'm talking really, really soft like this, we'd be de deviating just a little bit. And if I'm talking really, really loud like this, we'd be deviating up to the, up to the max. Most amateur FM transmitters are set so that they'll limit at uh, plus or minus 5 kilohertz. A few transceivers have got a setting to go to 2.5, but that's an internal adjustment in, in most radios. So the deviation ratio, uh, which we'll be covering in the next slide, is the ratio of maximum deviation to highest modulating frequency. So if we're allowed to, to transmit at plus or minus 5 kilohertz, FM, we compare that to the highest modulating frequency. And of course, that would typically be 3000 hertz. Most speech audio, the single sideband bandwidth case is um, 300 hertz, or 3000 uh, hertz, rather, 3kc. So that's a ratio of um, plus or minus five, or five for deviation. Highest modulating frequency would be, would be 3000. And this is an important point, and it might, it, it's an easy one to miss. The deviation ratio, this ratio given here, is constant for a given transmitter and modulator. These two values, the deviation and the highest modulating frequency, have nothing to do with the carrier frequency. So whatever this turns out to be, it's going to be the same for all bands and all, all frequencies for, of the radio. There's a trick question in the pool that um, we want to avoid. This gets into a little bit more detail. This was from, from Kassler. And we're showing down here a modulating waveform of, of 1 volt. What that means is we're, we're putting a 1 volt signal into our transmitter microphone input. And in this case, 1 volt uh, will generate a deviation of plus or minus 1.5 kilohertz. So we're well below limiting if, if the transceiver limits us to a maximum of of 5 uh, kilohertz plus or minus, we're well below that here. So what happens if we go from 1 volt microphone input to 2 volts? Well, the deviation is going to double. We're going to go from 1.5 kilohertz above and below the carrier frequency to plus or minus 3. And then if we double it again, we'll probably be in limiting, so we'd, we'd be probably right at the plus or minus 5 kilohertz. And then the transmitter is designed so you can't go beyond that. And the reason for that is if it could go is, is you know, the louder you get, the more deviation there would be from the center frequency. Uh, you'd start splattering it into adjacent um, conversations or adjacent channels. Wow. So this is just a demonstration saying that as you get louder, the, devi the amount of deviation increases. And then here's some scary looking stuff. There's some definitions here and a little bit of math. 
So this just puts it in, in the form of, of a formula, deviation ratio. It's the ratio of the maximum carrier frequency deviation, that would be like the plus or minus 5 kilohertz, to the highest audio modulating frequency. And for, uh, for voice, that would be 3 kilohertz. So the deviation ratio is just uh, stated here. And in the case that I just mentioned, we've got uh, plus or minus 5 divided by uh, 3. So 5 divided by 3, it works out to something like 1.67. Just to put some numbers to it. And here's an example that is actually a pool question. Calculate the deviation ratio of an FM phone signal having a maximum frequency a swing of plus or minus 7.5 kilohertz when the maximum modulation frequency is 3.5 kilohertz. Well, this wouldn't be a very realistic example because we know that most of our amateur transceivers will limit you to 5 kilohertz and the highest audio frequency is uh, usually 3 kilohertz voice frequency that's allowed to pass. So this isn't a very realistic example, but the math works. So 7.5 over 3.5 is 2.14 would be the answer to that, that it question. Could be it could, excuse me, Dad. It could be minus two one four because of the plus or minus. If it was indicated in your numerator as minus seven point five, or is that impossible? Oh, um, the the way the formula works, it just uses the, uh, the, the when you talk about maximum deviation, that's the amount either above or below the carrier. So e nice. either one would work. Yep. Thank you. And here here's a hint for both deviation ratio and modulation index calculations, of course we're just talking about deviation ratio right now, the way that you do the math um, might seem a little bit familiar. Remember we had op amp gain where we always took the bigger number, divided it by the smaller number? Well the same thing works here. Uh, the words are different all over the place, but the way the math works it's always the bigger number divided by the smaller. And they've done us a real wonderful favor here uh, by always putting both of these values in the same units, so kilohertz or, or hertz, so you don't have to do any funny, um, funny conversions. So this is good news. So other than definitions, we've got one here. Uh, we've also got a little bit of math, which is extremely easy. So we were talking about um, deviation ratio. Now let's talk about modulation index. Very similar concept. We'll have some diagrams to go with this too. In the definition, modulation index is the ratio of frequency deviation to modulating signal frequency. In the previous one, where we were considering um, the deviation ratio, we were talking about the maximum signal frequency. This happens to be whatever is coming in at the time. And with human voice, of course, that's varying continuously from 300 to 3,000, for example. And stated another way, it's the ratio of maximum RF frequency deviation, just like the previous formula, to the instantaneous modulating frequency, which, as I said, varies continuously with speech. A slightly different formula. And then here's something worth remembering, and this really threw me for a loop for a while. And I'll have a slide that explains this in a bit more detail. But um, FCC rule 1.0 is the highest modulation index permitted at the highest modulation frequency for angle modulation. And angle means FM, FM or PM, phase modulation, below 29 megahertz. So below 29 megahertz, 1.0 is the max that you can go. Therefore, you won't really see any FM any place on the ham bands, the HF ham bands, except on the top of 10 meters. And I'll show that in a bit here too. And again, our modulation index uh, is not dependent on the RF carrier frequency. We're talking about deviation amounts and audio frequencies. It's got nothing to do with the RF carrier frequency. So the modulation index would be the same from one band to another. And to mention that because there's a tricky, in fact, this is the pool question, tricky pool question. And here's another calculation example. Now the words are different, but the approach is exactly the same. Maximum frequency deviation, 3000 hertz either side of carrier. 
when the modulation frequency is 1000 Hertz. Just 3000 divided by 1000 equals 3. So that, that wouldn't be a legal combination below 29 megahertz. And then we'll explain that a little bit here. Um, this is the same thing kind of in different words here. Modulation index limited to a maximum of 1.0 under 29. So I put up a little picture of our 10 meter band. Notice that that runs from 28 megahertz to 29.7. So our, our limit is at 29, so that gives, that's giving us the upper part of the 10 meter band. So our transceivers are limited to plus or minus 5 kilohertz. Our voice frequencies that are allowed to pass can go up to 3, which gives us a modulation index of 1.67. And that's absolutely fine in the upper part of the 10 meter band. That's why we can, why we can use it. Now, I'm not aware of any FM repeaters in our area operating on, on, on 10 meters. There might be some in the bigger metro areas. But this is a, a band plan, a little slice of the band plan. And you can see that it starts at 29. It's magic frequency again. And there's designated places for AM, satellite links. And then this is the part that we're interested in, repeater inputs, FM simplex, repeater outputs. So if you have a 10 meter repeater in your area, um, the, this is where you would where you would find it. So then was that a, a rules limitation or a technology limitation? It, it's a Another rules one. rules limitation. Rules. So so you could operate FM anywhere if you were a pirate, for instance. Well, or if, gonna... or if you uh, stuck to this limit here, but you'd have to to have have these numbers work out. So this was 1.0 or less. In practice, you won't really find FM any place on, on the HF bands except at the top of uh, 10 meters, unless it was something really special or experimental. Yeah. So that, this was the piece that was really confusing to me. And then when I understood what happened at 29, then all of a sudden all of this made sense to me. Dave, I haven't seen the bottom half of that before. I've seen the top part in our in our frequency chart, but is that something that we just need to keep as a reference so we're not using the wrong frequencies in that 29 space? Oh, um, well, th this is from the, con this, this is a bigger document. I just uh, took out the stuff that was uh, on 10 meters. But if you go to the ARRL site and, and search on considerable, considerate operators frequency guide, that will give you all of the digital frequencies and special frequencies uh, over the entire uh, HF bands. Okay, so in, in addition to the, the first part, which I'm more familiar with, we should really pull out this considered operator's guide and, and know all that stuff too. Yeah, yeah, I, I keep a copy of that next to my radio. <laughs> I, I keep a copy of the ARRL band plan and, uh, the, um, and this document and refer to it often. Okay. What? Thanks. What? What did you? Excuse me. What did you mean, Dave, when you said you were, you didn't quite understand it until you understood what happens at twenty nine megahertz? Well, the the rules um, indicate that the this uh, limit of one point zero applies um, under twenty nine megahertz, and I I knew what a radio could do, and I couldn't figure out how you could ever have any FM communications with this limitation, but when you look at uh, the fact that all of the phone FM phone is above 29 megahertz, then it then it made sense. So I don't know uh, if that answered it or not, but that that's why we can have FM phone in 10 meters. This is kind of a um, well, it, it's relevant to what we're talking about here, uh, but it's also relevant to something that we've talked about in the past. You might remember that when we were talking about pre-emphasis and de-emphasis, uh, we said that a phase modulator gave you pre-emphasis for free. It was a part of the technology. In other words, a phase modulator will always, uh, the deviation is going to be increasing as the frequency, the audio frequency is going up. And with direct FM, remember we were modulating the oscillator directly, the uh, it was flat, absolutely flat. So we, for direct FM, we had to add pre-emphasis so that what we transmitted would look like this. And then on the receive side, we flattened out the curve using de-emphasis. 
So that, that was from a, a past class, and then let's, let's relate that to what we're talking about in, in this class. In FM, uh, and this is direct FM, where you're uh, actually modulating, uh, you're changing the oscillator frequency. Deviation depends only on the modulation, modulating signal amplitude. But with PM, the deviation is affected by both how loud you're speaking and the, the frequencies that are, are present. It's increasing them at, at double. It, so at it, it, uh, 1,000 cycle tone, if, if you went to 2,000 cycles, you'd have twice the deviation. It's a 6 dB per octave relationship. So all they're saying here is that deviation as a function of modulating frequency is something that you need to be aware of. And you don't really need to be aware of it <laughs> in a practical sense because the radio manufacturer will have uh, taken care of all of that in the radio. But because there's pull questions, we have to at least understand uh, the, the theory that's behind it. And here's an analogy. Uh, we're going to move on to multiplexing now, totally different subject area. Very interesting. Uh, we don't use it very much day to day in ham radio, but it's there and I'll, I'll indicate some places where it is used. So multiplexing is the combining, um, when you combine more than one stream of information into one modulating signal. And the analogy I came up with, this, this is a, a box of transistors. Notice all of the little bins. And if you could picture a voice conversation being in each one of these boxes instead of a pile of transistors. So this is uh, Fletch talking to, to Greg in this little box. And this one is uh, Mike uh, talking to Calvin in this little box. We've got several different conversations going on, all separated in their own little boxes. So we're going to take this uh, combination of conversations and we're going to put it into a bigger box and then we're going to put that on a FedEx truck and send it across the country. So the idea is that we're uh, taking multiple signals, combining them, sending them out over the air on our transmitter and then we're doing the reverse on the other end. That's the basic idea of, of multiplexing. Mm. So, and there's two flavors that we'll be talking about. One flavor is frequency division multiplex. That uses multiple subcarriers. We'll be expanding on this. The other flavor is time division multiplex, where we're taking parts of these individual signals and putting them into discrete time slots. And again, we'll be demonstrating that. There's actually a third one called wavelength division multiplexing that they use for putting multiple conversations on fiber optics, but we, we don't do that as hams, unless you did it inside your shack. So let's talk about frequency division multiplex. It's analog and it uses subcarriers. So what do we mean by that? So the definition, frequency division multiplex or FDM, two or more information streams are merged into a baseband which then modulates the transmitter. And if you could think of baseband as the total content um, that you're going to be modulating the transmitter with, that, that might be helpful. So let's look at how we do this here. We've, we've got, uh, th this is a conversation that's maybe between Fletch and Greg going between 100 hertz and up to 3.5 uh, kilohertz here. And that's just the the base audio. Then what we're going to do is we're going to put the next conversation maybe between Calvin and Bill right here. We're going to modulate a 4 kilohertz subcarrier with their audio. That's going to shift their audio up the band here to 4.1 to 7.5 kilohertz. And in a similar manner, we're going to um, have another subcarrier at 8, another one at 12. So we're going to wind up with a combination here that's actually four conversations going on at once, each one shifted by 4 kilohertz in, in frequency, uh, and then combined. So that's, that's shown up over here. So we're, here we have the individual uh, conversations going on. And here we've got the subcarriers that we're modulating.
those all go into a summer that's, uh, uh, which sums all of these signals together. That's like putting them into that cardboard box before we ship it across the country via FedEx. That goes out the transmitter. Here we're shipping it across the country. And then on the receive side, that process is just reversed. So we've got four conversations going on at one time, being transmitted and then being decoded and sent out to the respective individuals when it makes it across. And you've heard there's no free lunch. Well, this takes up a lot more room, a lot more frequency than an individual. For example, a single sideband conversation is just three kilohertz, but these four multiplexed would be uh, running up to like 15.5 kilohertz. I don't know of any place that we um, use that day to day. I will have some examples coming up that show that. But this is the concept of frequency division multiplex using subcarriers, all analog. Common usage, um, there are some multi-carrier digital modes. The early phone company carrier circuits worked like this. You could imagine running wires across the country. Uh, they'd like to get as many conversations on those wires as they could. The cable TV works that way. How do you get 300 channels uh, at your home over one wire? Well, it's probably like this. And then FM broadcast subcarriers, the Muzak that you hear in stores, that comes out, um, comes from commercial FM stations that are selling that service to, to stores. And that, that's how that works, it's a subcarrier. Now we're gonna move on. Well, actually this is a bigger, bigger picture. I should have switched to that when I was explaining it. You see the subcarriers that are here. And then we saw that picture already. The other one that we'll talk about is digital um, time division multiplex, or TDM. This is kind of an interesting uh, picture. I've got it in a bigger version here. Now here we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five conversations going on. What's happening is we're sampling each one of these conversations and then switching between them very quickly. So if, if Fletch were talking to Greg again, he wouldn't be aware that all of this was happening in the background. The switching would be happening so fast that the two of these uh, guys could talk and not notice anything unusual. So that's the concept of time division multiplex. A few more notes about it. Um, here's some blue text. We'll see it in a pool question. Digital uh, TDM. Two or more signals are arranged to share discrete time slots of a data transmission. So here we're sampling conversation A is red. So here we've got the red one. And uh, we, we're sampling all of these and eventually putting them into a signal that looks like this. So each one of these samples goes into a time slot and then you, only, then you can transmit this out uh, on, on one circuit. Okay, we talked about that. Now the switching speed is fast enough uh, so that you won't notice any difference. Now, remember the Nyquist theorem? How, how fast are we gonna have to switch to make this work? You might think about that. Well, if, if the conversation is happening at um, three, um, three kilohertz, our, our voice frequency, we're gonna have to be sampling it at least twice that in order to be able to, re to recreate it on the other side. So Nyquist comes back to visit us again here as well. Where do we see it in amateur usage? Uh, D-Star, some of you are familiar with. Some of, some of the digital modes are capable of using it. Satellite repeater telemetry. And then in, on the commercial front, uh, digital phone circuits and ISDN. So this, this is real stuff and it is actually used. You won't run into it very often uh, day to day uh, with, with your transceiver, but uh, you, you need to know that this exists. Ah, and here we go. Let's see how well we covered that. So what is the highest modulation index permitted at the highest modulation frequency for, for angle modulation, meaning FM or PM, 
below 29 megahertz. Beta. No, it's one. It's 1 1.0, which is a, a beta, right. I thought you said data. What, <laughs> what, is the, what is the modulation index of an FM signal? So we had, uh, we had two flavors. We had modulation index and deviation ratio. Ratio of it's uh, alpha. Well, it is alpha, right? Ratio of the frequency deviation to the modulating signal frequency. That's correct. So that's a definition. So that's just something that you might be able to find a trick to uh, remembering. Um, and I think I've got a trick here. Yeah, and I'm not seeing it right now. Okay, now notice I've, I've bolded something here, and when you, when you go to take your test, it, it will not be bolded. <laughs> but, but I wanted you to pick up on the, uh, th these words. How does the modulation index of a phase modulated emission vary with RF carrier frequency? You remember we made a big point? Doesn't have anything to do with that. Absolutely, doesn't depend on the RF carrier frequency. So if, if you well, see that, frequency, right? yep. <clears throat> and here's a calculation question. And I mentioned that those pretty much all work the same. <laughs> now you can get, write, yeah. write down the formula. Sure. And so what's the answer? Larger to a smaller. <laughs> yeah, divide the, uh, the big one by the small one. Three, alpha. Yeah, exactly. And they, they use all different words to get at these, but the principle is the same across the board. And the, that's the way the formula works out. That's funny. Here's another one. It's going to be 6 divided by 2. Or 3. Here they're asking for the deviation ratio. But the four, David. That delta. Five divided by three. One point six seven. Yep. Now here they change the words. They they're talking about an FM phone signal. They haven't used that word before, but it doesn't matter. The formula works the same way. A alpha. Exactly. Yep. 7.5 divided by 3.5. They're both kilohertz, so we don't have to do anything fancy there. What is deviation ratio? And we had a past student that noticed that the right answer, uh, only the right answer, contains the word deviation. So we've got deviation in the, in the question. <laughs> Get a bravo. Right, that works. Or if you remember that the uh, formula involves maximum deviation and highest audio frequency, those words are here as well. But I, I thought it was very creative that they noticed that deviation uh, appeared in both of these. So that there's a little shortcut that you can take there. So a lot of confusing stuff, but uh, there, there's not a lot you have to remember. What is, oh, now we're going to move into the next one. What is frequency division multiplexing? You know, think about this a little bit. Uh, it has something to do with time slots, right? Frequency. Well, frequency division multiplexing. B, e, bravo. Oh, yeah. That is correct. And let's just kind of talk through it. Um, right, yeah, this isn't, yeah, and I, I just lied to you, that, that would not be time slots. <laughs> Gary's back there laughing his head off. <laughs> yeah, frequency division multiplexing is, is normally analog, and we're um, using, what we're using here is the, the subcarriers. Uh, 
Yeah. All right. So I hope I didn't confuse anybody too bad there. That's frequency division multiplexer. Well, yeah. We're just testing us to see if we were still paying attention. Right? Uh, yeah. Wake yeah, up. Yeah. And, and the wake up would have to apply to me in this case. <laughs> so what is time division multiplexing? Oh, boy. Yeah, Discrete here, time slots, beta. Yeah, and here, here's our time slots, and this will not be bolded in your test, but what, the, what you're looking for is, is that as a clue. And then we'll move on. We're doing great for time. If we get out early tonight, that would be awesome. Now, where to find digital activity? Um, the considerate frequency or, uh, operator's guide will, will have a lot of these things called out on it, too. And what I'll do when I send out an email to you all, I'll include a copy of the, the link that will take you there. You can go to the ARRL site and just uh, search on considerate operator's uh, frequency guide, and this stuff will come up as well. Does anybody know what kind of a radio this is? Looks like yours. 7300. Yeah, it's a 7300. Uh, do, oh, radio. Does it, it, well, it's not mine. I've, I've, I've got the big brother to this one, but um, does anybody have a 7300? I do. You, Looking right at it. My okay. friend does. Yep. It's a good radio. The, the <coughs> Yesu 991, which I know Scott has, is also a very good radio to get, get started with. Um, but I, I really like this and recommend it if, if you can afford the price range. They're under $1,000, but it's a true SDR, um, and uh, it's all, all new technology. So I, I, and everybody that I've talked to that's bought one has loved it, so I want one for a backup radio eventually. Put that on my Christmas what, list. What's the, what's the uh, advantage of your radio over this radio? Would it be the specs, or does it have different bands? Oh, no, the same, same bands, but the 7610 has got dual receivers and oh, um, okay. some additional features that are, are pretty handy. But you can do and so it. Is it twice the price? Uh, it's like $3,000. It's about 1000 roughly. Wow. So I, I don't recommend that for somebody just getting started. And this does 80 80 percent of what uh, what the 7610 will. So I just just wanted to. The you mentioned is it is it as as up to date as this radio in terms of the SDR and the the waterfall and all of that, or is it a little behind this? Well, the specs are are pretty close, um, but it, it's it's not an SDR. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you couldn't actually run it from a computer like you can this one if if you want to. So here's. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that ICOM's going to come out with a. Uh, Dual or a uh, dual for the seventy one hundred instead of just yeah. having one frequency to monitor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm guessing they probably won't because that that's a couple of years old now. But th these are some frequencies you you can refer to, um, and it, it's fun sometimes just just to listen. You won't be able to understand the digital, but you can do the decoding. There's a decoding software that's avail available for free. In some cases, the decoding software is actually built into the radio mm. for some of the modes. Here's a couple of books to help you get started. This, this one is now in its second edition. In, it, in addition to talking about, I heard somebody say that they hadn't been into digital yet. This would probably be a, a, something that would be worth considering. This one's a little bit older, uh, but because this one covers the new FT8 uh, modes, um, if you're only going to buy one, I'd get this one. Sometimes they sell them as a two-for-one deal. But there's Will one of these modes eventually dominate and, and it seems like everybody's doing different things right now, but will one or two of them become more popular and then or, or will there always be new ones, I guess? I think there will always be new ones coming on the scene, but when PSK31 came out, it was the, the digital mode that just took the ham world by storm. Everybody was using right. it. And then when FT8 came out, that just exploded. I mean... The, um, the the activity, the band activity is just incredible on FT8. Um, so yeah, it's some, something worth uh, digging into. So now we'll, we'll get into the next section here. Symbol rate, data rate, and bandwidth. And I've got some analogies here that I think you're going to find fun. Talk about some definitions. Uh, bit. Does anybody know what bit stands for, by the way? Stands for binary, binary digit. 
binary digit bit. It's a fundamental unit of data, either a zero or a one. Thank you, high school. Yep. Now, how many bits can you send from one computer system to the other? It's called the bit rate, bits per second. Now a symbol, and here we're going to get into something that has been confusing to a lot of folks. A symbol is a characteristic of the transmitted signal that represents data. Now a symbol and a bit aren't necessarily the same thing. The symbol rate for digital transmission is the rate which the waveform changes to convey information. So you can do something to the waveform between a transmitter and a receiver that might represent more than one bit on the other end. We'll have some examples of that. But the key words to recognize here are as shown. Now baud is the number of symbols sent per second, also known as the symbol rate. And here's a key one. Symbol rate and baud are exactly the same. So symbol rate and baud are the same, but bits per second might not match the symbol rate or the baud. And I'll show you how that works coming up. But before doing that, and this was a, from, from, from Kessler, he talked about um, different kinds of links. Now we're going to have Bob and Alice. This is Bob. This is Alice. As far as they're concerned, they just want to talk to each other. They may not care how any of this works. But as hams working on your extra, you definitely want to know how it works. So these folks are talking into um, something that winds up with a computer. And the computers are talking to each other. And the computers don't really know, don't really care what happens over here. They just want to talk computer stuff between them. Then we get up to what's called the air link, where we have an actual transmitter and receiver going. And that's the top of the chain. So we move to the uh, person, digitize the audio, somehow code it so that it can be transmitted. Eventually winds up with Alice. Air link, data link. And then the people. And here we've got Bob and Alice again, person to person, the data link is computer to computer, the air link is transmitter to receiver, just some high level concepts. That's the complete communications channel. Now, this can be interesting. I'm, I'm going to demonstrate how baud rate and bit rate can be different. If I raise my hand, that would be one symbol. But I can have different number of fingers. So I, I can represent more than just saying hello. If I raise my hand, we're across uh, from each other in a big dining room. Um, you'd probably be thinking that I'd be saying hello to you. Okay, well, that, that's nice. So hold up one hand. That's one signaling event or symbol. And if I did that once per second, that would be a rate of one baud. Now in this example, one signaling event can represent six states. So I've got five fingers or a closed fist. And we might remember uh, that uh, to figure out how many states that can represent, that's two to the fifth, or 32 bits can be represented this way. So by just using one hand, I can show up to 32 different uh, states. And I'll be demonstrating that in a minute too. Now in electronics, uh, phase shifts. Now of course radios don't understand fingers. You notice that there aren't any impolite uh, hand signs here, which we appreciate. Notice is very thoughtful. Yes, right. Um, so for, in electronics, you can make a change uh, between a transmitter and a receiver and that change could be a phase shift. It could be a, to a change in tone frequencies. It could be a, a change in levels, soft or loud. So these are all, all ways that we can vary the information between a transmitter and a receiver without having to use hands. Let me back up here. 
Oh yeah, I, I wanted to share one other thing too. Um, that th this, this was the hello, how, how are you across the room, but maybe this symbol represents uh, bring me a cheeseburger. <laughs> this symbol is bring me a cheeseburger and a Coke. So you can see how you can convey different kinds of information by, by counting fingers. So how do we get to 32 different states? Well, if we assign a value to each finger, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, you might remember the binary counting slide that we, we used in a previous class. Um, let's come over here and, and consider this one. This finger is being held up, which is the two finger. So if I were to do this, I'd be saying number two. This hand signal, we've got two and four raised, so that would be the number six. If we had all five fingers raised, if, if you add all of these up, 16 plus eight plus four plus two plus one, that's 31. Now it'd be pretty complicated if somebody were flashing their hand uh, rapidly to figure all of that out, but for a computer, that's, that's child's play. So that, that's the concept of, um, of binary counting, using the available number of bits that you have. Now, here's, here's another explanation um, and a pool question. A more efficient digital code can increase the data rate without increasing the bandwidth. So what we have here is a, we start out with a, a, a baud rate of 300. And if we've got two states, just binary ones or zeros, that's all we can send, we're going to have bits per second coming out to 300. However, if we can represent four states, like different number of fingers or phase shifts or levels, we can increase that bit rate to 600 bits per second. And you can see as it goes up, it gets higher and higher. So you might remember the very early modems and everybody thought this was so cool when it first came out. You could actually uh, connect your computer to a modem and dial up your friend across town and carry on, you know, send, send text back and forth to each other. And we thought that that was wonderful when it first came out. Of course, 300 bits per second now is so slow that we'd, uh, uh, we'd, we'd shoot ourselves before we try to commute that, communicate that way. And I think the next jump was to 1200 bits per second and eventually we got all the way up to 56k bits per second. Most people couldn't actually get 56k between their modems because there's too much noise in the, uh, between, the, between the modems for that to work. They were pretty smart. They'd scale back until they could communicate and then, then communicate at that speed. So when there's more than two states per transition, the bits per second can be much higher than the baud rate the symbols per second in radio terms. Talk a little bit about protocols and codes. A protocol is basically the rule book for encoding, packaging, and exchanging and decoding digital data. Oh, before I get there, did anybody ever have one of these? Anybody know what this is? A decoder ring? That's a secret decoder ring. Yes, absolutely. I think they used to come in... Uh, Cracker Jacks boxes before they got so cheap, or you could mail in for one. Today they'd probably cost 50 bucks, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, anyway, protocol rules, it's a, the rules for, uh, that you have to abide by on the transmitted and receiving side so you can understand. That's a technology thing. And a code is a method of conversion to and from digital data. And we've got some, some terms here, a very code is the code that's used by the PSK31 protocol. You'll see very, very code written in, um, with a capital V and a lower V. The, the capital V is actually a, a, a trademark associated with, uh, with, with this uh, uh, mode. There's another kind of uh, very code that we're going to talk about, Morse code. And the idea is that you send fewer bits for more frequently used letters. Now, the most frequently used letter in the English language is the lowercase e. So in very code or Morse code, it's the, the shortest symbol uh, in the character set. So, I didn't know that. Yep, 
So we've got variable length coding for bandwidth efficiency. So if, if it's something we're going to be using a lot, we're going to use a short code. And that happens with PSK31 and Morse code. We'll also be talking about, so that this is Vericode, um, uh, Bado, and people pronounce that all different ways. I'll pronounce it the same way Kastler does. Bado is a code with five bits. And it's real important to remember five because there's a pool question that is extremely confusing. And if you can remember that Bado has got five bits, you'll get the answer. Now remember that uh, with five bits, you can only represent um, 31 characters, so uh, which is two to the fifth or 32. In order to get numbers, uh, switch from letters to numbers, they actually have a shift code to move it uh, between so you can get more than just the, those uh, 32, 32 characters. Then we've got ASCII. And I will be talking about that a little bit more. That's seven bits, which allows numbers and letters without, it, without a shift character. And this, this is an RTTY tape. When we were having our in-person classes, I would pass, pass one of these around so people could look at it. I forgot to bring it tonight, or I could put it on the uh, calculator cam. Um. So for, we're going to get in, into this in greater detail. Uh, for now, just, just uh, take that as, uh, as a beginning. There's something called ale, and it's not something you drink. It's called automatic, well, it is something you drink, but not in, not in this case. So automatic link establishment is what that stands for. And this, this is a protocol that will automatically determine the best band for communication between two stations. And it'll let you know when it happens. So let, let's see how that let's see how that works here. We've got a, a transmitter and a receiver. And they're running the AL protocol. You can see that 17 meters is jumping over your intended target, so you have no communications. 40 meters. I know this is kind of hard to read, but I'm telling you what it is. 40 meters also misses your destination. The skip path uh, doesn't come down where your intended target is but 20 meters does come down where your target is. So what AL does is it tries these different bands or frequencies till it finds one that works and then it alerts you that, hey, I can, I can get that rare QSL card to Idaho today on this band. Mm. So that's kind of cool. It's finding more use uh, amongst amateurs and there's a, a website that will give all kinds of information on that. that that'll, in fact, it's right here. You'll get this in the uh, in the mailing or in the link that we send. So that that's how we can tell if we've got a path, and it can the protocol will run without human intervention. And there is actually a pool question that's new in this new pool. Now, how do uh, automatic link establishment stations establish contact? They constantly scan a list of frequencies activating the radio when the designated call sign is received. That's the end result and how it works. We'll continue on our protocol and codes path and talk about Morse code. Now, if you haven't seen this before, people have been just absolutely amazed. Uh, let, let me get into some history. This, this is an old-fashioned type case back in the late 1800s or whenever newspapers first came out they would have something called a type case and in each one of these boxes would be uh, a whole bunch of these letters they were actually made out of lead and it would be the letter e so they would take a, a bar and if you wanted to spell the word street you'd grab an s wherever the s is t r e e t and you'd actually put these individual letters into the into the type bars with spaces and you'll notice that the e is the biggest box because the lowercase e is the most frequently used letter in the english language and then the other boxes you can see by their relative size how often they're used well they used this concept when they came up with the morse code now if when we're sending morse code we're going to start here where it says start here and you'll notice that e is a single dot 
or dit, as we call it in the Morse code. So to send the letter E, it's just a single dit. T, also a frequently used letter, is a single dash. And I is dit dit. And you, you can follow the, the pattern. The less frequently, less frequently used letters um, are way out on the end of the tree. So the letter Y, for example, would be dash, dash, dot, dash, da, 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 da. So that, that's an, a structure for the Morse code that very few people have seen before <laughs> and have found yeah. quite, quite amazing in how it came together. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, it really is. And notice, notice when this came out, uh, 1844, way before we were doing radio. So is there's a, there's a relationship between use in, in English and assignment of icons of, to, to represent those. So, you know, if it's simple, like T or M or O, then they're more commonly used in the language than might be D right. or B or Exactly, P. exactly right. And uh, the Morse code one is fairly easy to see, but they took the same approach when they were doing PSK 31. They used shorter uh, code lengths uh, in, in that digital protocol. Like so that. a little bit more on, on Morse code. Note the dependence on standard English letter frequencies. I kind of explained that. And the concept of variable length codes, most frequently used characters get shorter codes. Let me back up and just make a comment here. If you're, go if you're wanting to learn Morse code, don't take this approach, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because if you have to count dots and dashes, um, you're going to really be handicapped. You, when learning Morse code, you've got to learn it, by, learn it by the sound of the characters. But if you can see how they come together, that, that's instructive. Then there's something called the gray code, and this goes back to 1878. Well, if we've got a, a, a digital code, code called the gray code that we use today, what in the world were they doing with it back then? And the answer is uh, heavy duty machinery would be using uh, switches and relays to function. And let, let me explain why, why that mattered. Now the gray, well, let me talk about what the gray code is, first of all. Um, digital code where only one bit changes between sequential code values. So here, if we've got binary, when we go from 0 to 1, it's 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 1. And there's only one thing between those two that have changed. This went from a 0 to a 1. Gray code, same. Now when we go to from 1 to 2, if we look in binary, we're changing two things. This character changes and this char character changes. In the gray code, they have constructed that so that only one bit changes. So for every, as, as you're counting, there's only a change of one bit each time you advance down the gray code. And the reason that that's important is that it, it allows for some error detection with the switches and relays you wouldn't want to launch a missile because you had a defective relay. I don't know if they had missiles back in 1878, but they, they had large machinery. And uh, of course, relays and switches were, weren't very reliable, so that the gray code would allow them to detect errors and avoid uh, doing things that they didn't mean to do. In our world, in digital, of course, we can detect this digitally and say, oops, um, something's wrong and then act on it. This is a picture of a rotary encoder. This is an example of where you see gray code today. I've got a bigger picture here, I think. There it is. And what we're doing is we're shining a light through a code wheel, and then there's light emitting, not, well, this is a light emitting diode, but there's photo detectors on the other side that will read the pattern on the wheel as you're turning the wheel. You've probably noticed on your transceivers, you've got controls and knobs that don't have a stop on them. You, you can just rotate and rotate like the VFO knob, for example. And this is what's happening. 
This is called a rotary encoder. And that's how it works. So would that be inside a radio or what would, where would that be utilized? Oh yeah, yeah, the, the VFO knob on your, on your transceiver is probably using a rotary encoder. Any knob on your radio, if it turns and turns and turns and never hits a stop, is, is probably a rotary, rotary encoder. I see. So eventually it just gets back to the start of the wheel, but doesn't need a stop. Exactly. It, the, the code just rolls around uh, back, back to zero. Wow. And it can facilitate error detection because if more than one bit changes, then something's wrong. And here it is, just a little bigger size. A bigger picture. Then we'll talk about ASCII for a few minutes and take a break. ASCII is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. 1960. See, we're really getting into the space age now. All this other stuff that we were looking at was ancient Morse code and rotary encoders, gray code. Well, the gray code anyway. So the concept with ASCII, it's uh, typically seven bits, so you can put a lot more information in. Um, I think seven, uh, two to the seventh power, I think works out to 128. So you can get all of the uppercase letters, all the lowercase letters, and a whole bunch of symbols in ASCII. It can be seven or eight, uh, the, the data can be seven or eight bits. This is an example of letter A. LSB means least significant bit. In uh, decimal counting, we start with ones, then we go to tens and hundreds, the least significant being the smallest. It kind of works the same way here. And then bytes can be lumped for digital, for, for transmission. So this is the letter A. So maybe we're going to send A, B, C, D, E. So we'd have um, seven or eight bits in each one of these little boxes. And you could send a whole string of text. And those strings can be uh, concatenated into packets. And we'll be talking about packets next week. But a packet can contain a header, like an address of where you're wanting to send this packet can contain all of this information, which might be an email message. And then parity is a concept where you can detect if there's errors in any of this, in, any, in any of this data. Well, that's a high level picture. Here's a little bit more on, on Badeau. Five bits in blue, two to the fifth equals 32. And here's uh, the code decoded. So letter A would be bit one and bit two. You can see the pattern. Then over here, we've got um, shift. We've got a shift to go to figures. So if you would send this character, then all of these bottom ones would be interpreted as the values. If you want to go back to letters again, you'd send this character, and then everything that's being sent would be interpreted as letters. So that, that's how you can get uh, double duty out of such a small number of bits. And here's the handsome, handsome dude that invented this back in 1870. Of course, they, this, this was applied to teletype machines back then. He doesn't look like Bridget Bordeaux. He doesn't, but it, it, that's a meal. Oh, he looks like you, Bill. <laughs> and that's what's thinking about. It does, before you turned white. This was Bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bill, Bill's Bill's famous. Famous. <laughs> yeah. No, he has hair. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he, w he was a, a French uh, telegraph engineer. And, uh, before he went into the cold front business? I guess so. I guess so. He yeah, has Smith Brothers or whatever it was. So, yep, and uh, I actually I went to a ham fest where they had a bunch of teletype equipment set up and actually running. It was just, just fascinating to see all of this stuff clicking and clacking away. Oh. So here's an example of, of how the five bits work out. It, it has a mark and a space tone, and we've got mark and space in uh, radio teletype and, and, and uh, Bado. Anybody know where the mark and space terms came from? 
Yes, it was when you printed it out, it would make a mark a long or a space, wouldn't it? Exactly, yep. It would be a, uh, a pen held up by a spring. And then when you <laughs> energized a, a, a solenoid, it would pull the pen down to the paper and make a mark. And then when you cool. released the solenoid, it would lift the pen and you'd have a space. So uh, that terminology has uh, followed us through all the way to today. Well, so we've got mark, which is the rest condition. There's a start bit when we see it go from a high to a low, high frequency or low frequency in, in this case. Um, that's the indication of a start symbol. And then it's watching the time slots for five bits, uh, zero through four, that adds up to five. So that, that um, transmits bits on the, on, the, on the tape in this case, and it's interpreted on the other side. And then the stop bit says, okay, I've stopped sending you a character, go back to sleep, and then a, a start symbol will uh, be the signal to start the next character. So that's, that's how it works. That's how radio teletype works too. So a little bit of difference between the two here. Uh, both ASCII and, and Bado have start bits, parity bits, and stop bits. Well, ASCII has uh, parity bits. There is no parity with, um, with Bado. And what parity is, um, I think I've got a slide that explains that in a bit, but it, it counts the number of bits that are there and then has the ability to set either a one or a zero, depending upon if it's an even or odd number of bits to help detect errors. Transmissions can come at any time, asynchronous, so they need an indicator to signify the start and stop. That's what the start and stop bits are for. And, oh yeah, here's the explanation for ASCII, an advantage of using parity bits. Some types of, oh, I've spelled interesting, <laughs> errors can be detected. Even parity, even number of ones in the data frame, odd parity, odd number of ones. So you actually reserve a bit in the code that you're sending, uh, and if, if you know that it's even or odd parity, you, you can detect if there's an error. And generally, uh, just about all ASCII configurations today use no parity. We've got one and a half stop bits for Bado, one stop bit for two. And this is interesting here, interesting history. It used to be that two stop bits were used for mechanical teleprinters because it took them a little bit more time to react. But for electronic devices, there's normally always one stop bit if you're using ASCII today. And here's a code table. And one piece of blue text, ASCII advantage over Bado can send both upper and lowercase text. And then the pool questions, and we'll take a break. What is the definition of symbol rate in a digital transmission? <clears throat> now the symbol is the number of times we're changing something uh, in, in the transmitted waveform. Delta. Which is... Charlie, the rate at which the waveform changes to convey information. That's like holding up my hand in a certain number of fingers. Those fingers can uh, signify different um, messages, the cheeseburger, the cheeseburger, and the Coke, but it's, uh, it, it's the hand raising or the phase shift or the, uh, the, the tone change is the, uh, the symbol that is sent. How may data rate be increased without increasing the bandwidth? Another way to say this would be how can you get a higher number of bits per second without increasing the symbol rate? Or See both. Charles? Using a more, dig more efficient digital code where one symbol could represent a different number of bits. Yes. What is the relationship between symbol rate and baud? Be careful not to get caught on this one. There is none. They're the same. Yep. Mm -hmm. How do automatic link establishment stations establish contact? Scan the frequencies. 
Just to freak, yeah, they, they scan um, frequencies that are agreed between the two and find one that'll work and then alert the operator. Now, which HF digital modes use a variable length code for bandwidth well, efficiency? And we only talked about one. Actually, we talked about two with Morse, Morse code, but this, this is a digital code. Remember what it was? Different number of uh, code elements depending upon how frequently the letter was used in the alphabet. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Yes. That, that, yeah, yeah that, that's the hint. <laughs> PSK31. Yeah, that's the, the PSK31 is associated with, with very code. What is the advantage of including parity bits with ASCII? Delta. Yes, some types of errors can be detected, correct, by counting the number of uh, number of bits that are high or low, even or odd. Okay, now this is the one, uh, do you remember the magic trick for solving this one? Differences between Badeau and ASCII, it has to do with how many data bits there are in Badeau. Uh, There's five, right? There's five, right. Remember, I, I said, remember five. Because it'll help. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Correct. Now, all of those other things are true, too, but it's way too much to remember. <laughs> if, you, if you can remember that the five bits is the way that you solve this one. What an advantage of using ASCII for data communications. There's a, a trap. Well. There's a trap in uh, these answers, but go, yeah, what, what were you going to say? I, I was thinking you could do upper and lower case, but then you scared me off. Oh, okay. Well, yes, upper and lower case is the answer. Uh, the one that can trap you is this one. It includes built-in error correction features. No, it, uh -huh. it, you, you, you can do error detection, but not correction. So that, that, that's an easy way to get this one wrong. But upper and lower case is, is what they're looking for. And Badeau uses the shift code to go between numeric and special characters. So there, there's a couple of ways you could easily trip on this one, but you got, yeah. it, you got it right. Which code changes only one bit between sequential code values? E. Yep, the gray code. Hmm. I, uh, think, I think this one might have got out of sequence because like, we didn't talk about the, um, the the answer happens to be 52, but we're, we're going to cover that in the next in the next uh, section. So I, I think this one is repeated. What fact is and with the was transmitted CW signal. Yeah, I've got some things out of sequence here. Uh, let, let me figure, let's take a break at this point and I'll, I'll figure that part out and we'll, we'll pick it up when we get back. So five minutes is our magic time. And we'll go ahead and set our five minute timer and uh, close, close the audio for, for a bit. Mm -hmm.
Oh yeah. I'm, uh, all over, uh, the bands and, um, well, I've made contacts all over the place on, uh, the extra portion of the bands over. I put up a new antenna too for 160 meters down to six. So it's working good. I built myself uh, an air cannon like you have, only a little different. I can launch into the stratosphere now. Okay, and we should be live again. All right, and I found out what uh, what went wrong with the two pool questions that we hadn't covered yet. They they belong in the next section, so I moved them. Uh, so you won't miss anything. We'll we'll get it correct. All right, any comments or questions before we move on? All right, you're all doing well, except Bill. It looks like fell into the uh, into the water. I can only see the bridge. Oh well. So we'll go back to the the deck. And I've got to turn it back on. So from current slide, get my laser pointer turned on again. And we're back in business. So we're going to start a new section here. More of 8.2. And this slide shows um, some of the common modulation methods that we see below 30 megahertz. We'll be getting into more depth on PSK31, Morse code and single side band voice. Now, there's an interesting thing here. Uh, it says that with PSK31, you can the bandwidth uh, of the signal is very, very narrow, 37.5 hertz, super narrow. You can get a whole bunch of these in one single sideband channel. Uh, and the speed, uh, this is basically a keyboard to keyboard mode. Uh, you can go up to 50 words per minute, and that's really what it was designed for. With Morse code at 13 words per minute, that takes up a bandwidth of 52 hertz, which is actually a little bit wider than uh, PSK31. And then single sideband voice up to 120 words per minute, and of course that takes 3,000 hertz of, of bandwidth. Now, I don't know if anybody's done this study yet. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if male and female operators Don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> have the same number of words per minute here. So if somebody wants to study that and get back to us, uh, you, you, you can. I don't know which way it'll come out. So we'll, we'll leave it at, at that. I would uh, guess, but I'm, I'm not Don't feel like taking the risk tonight. No, thank you. Yeah, yeah. We could get in trouble because I think we may have some ladies with us and we, we don't want to offend them or we don't want to offend the men either. You know, in this woke culture, we won't go there either. So frequency shift keying is a common, and, and this will show up, that they have some really random things in the pool questions. Frequency shift keying is a common data emission below 30 megahertz, FSK. There are different flavors of, of frequency shift keying. We'll talk about some of them. In fact, we'll talk about it right now. So RIDI, radio teletype, we've got two different tones shifting from one frequency to the other. And they're called mark and space. And typically they're at 2295 and 2125 uh, for, for frequency values or tones, tones that are being shifted. Being shifted about 170 hertz between the two to make mark the difference. Space represents zero, mark represents one. And here's a spectrum picture. You can see the two frequencies. This is what it looks like in, in a waterfall. Mm. So if, if you use some of those uh, frequencies that I mentioned, and if you've got a radio that's got a spectrum display on it, uh, you can actually tune to some of the data uh, frequencies and, and see these displays. And the software that does this, um, FL Digi was one of the, one of the early ones. And Ham Radio Deluxe uh, has a, a, a sub uh, module called DM780 that, that does all of the digital modes. So there's, there's a bunch of other ones out there as, as well. 
It's a matter of needing that software on your uh, computer to actually do the decoding. A little bit more on radio teletype, RTTY. It's frequency shift keying mode. Not sure what that was. So computer, it... stop. Oh, okay. We have an Alexa back there with the keyword, and I won't say it. But... Yeah. <laughs> So Alexa is trying to compete with us here, because I said a bad word. <clears throat> By bad, it means one that Alexa recognizes. All right, so th this is radio teletype, the mark and space frequencies shifted by 170 hertz. Uh, there were some earlier um, terminal network controllers that used 200, uh, which was close enough, but what, anything that you use in software today will, will be 170 hertz shift between mark and space. This is just for awareness that there are other ones out there. Now there's, um, this was interesting the way Kassler explained this, uh, <laughs> pure FSK and AFSK. So to, to get frequency shift um, keying working, there's the two methods. There's something called direct FSK, where we are directly changing the frequency of, of the oscillator. This isn't the same as direct FM and, and, and PM. This is a slightly different concept. So we're sending uh, that we've got control lines coming into the radio that directly modulates the VFO. That's direct FSK. The other method is called audio FSK, where we're generating tones, the tones that I, I mentioned uh, previously. We're sending audio tones to a single sideband transmitter. USB mode, which is um, used for, for RIDI, and sending it out. So with audio FSK, it's single sideband um, sending audio tones. For direct FSK, we're directly modulating the VFO. And uh, Kassler commented that there's been a great deal of controversy in the ham world about which one is better. And his conclusion was if audio FSK is set up correctly, uh, it will, it, they're identical. So the key things to know here is the difference between direct FSK, we're directly modulating an oscillator, and audio FSK, where we're generating tones and transmitting them in single sideband. The software that you're going to be using uh, will normally have some kind of a graphic display um, showing mark and space and the relationship between mark and space will help you to troubleshoot issues. So we'll come back to that. Diagram A shows, shows proper tuning and equal levels and mar of mark and space. These are about the, the, the same shape and size both ways. Diagram B shows mistuning. Different size and they're, they're not uh, at right angles. So it could be a filter cutoff or selected fading going on. And C is another indication of, of a problem, mistuning or wrong tone spacing. This is the one that you want to see. And then selective fading is indicated when one of the ellipses suddenly disappears. And that's, that's kind of amazing because these things are only 170 hertz apart. So for selective fading to only affect a frequency that's 170 hertz away from the other one is, is pretty remarkable, but it does happen. So these tuning indicators will, will help you see what's going on if you're using uh, one of these modes. Note the blue text. Now we're going to get into calculating bandwidth for different kinds of uh, data and CW emissions. And there's formulas here uh, that are explained. Uh, well, Kassler walks through them, and it's explained in our book. And you don't have to memorize these formulas. I'm going to give you a way of uh, coming up with an answer. It's a, a very helpful shortcut. So the bandwidth is affected by the symbol rate in baud and the shaping factor. There's things that go into the calculation. And note that faster baud rate is more bandwidth. It kind of makes sense. 
and here's a calculation for again FSK or AFSK. It's K uh, times shift and all of that's explained down here. So the shift is 170 Hertz for RTTY and how the formula is applied. A little bit different for 4800 Hertz shift. And the trick, um, and this is, this is the, the one that I want you to remember because there's about three different formulas that apply to bandwidth. But this, this trick will get you to the answer for all three of them without having to memorize the, the formulas. Now I'm, I'm totally fine if you want to memorize the formulas and know how to apply them. Um, if I ever needed to do that, I'd go look it up. <laughs> so what I'm going to do here is do you a little favor and, and, and give you the shortcut. So for the purpose of our pool questions, the bandwidth will be the answer closest to four times the shift. So in this case, the shift is a seven, 170 hertz. And if you multiply that times four, what, what do you get? Does somebody have a calculator? You can do that for us quick. 170 times 4, what does that come out to be? 680. 680, okay. And when we get to the pool questions, we're going to see that 680 is the closest answer to, to 504. What if we multiply 480, or 4800 by 4, what do we get? 1920. Okay. And you can see that's off somewhat from here, but it's going to be the value that's the closest of the ones we're going to see in, in, the, uh, in the pool questions. So again, you can use these formulas or you can use my shortcut, which is what I recommend. For CW, um, just talk about what um, some concepts here. That's our A1A designator that we don't really care about, but that's, that's what it turns out to be. So the simplest form uh, of CW is turning an AM transmitter on and off. Now, why do you suppose we'd be wanting to turn an AM transmitter on and off to send CW? Any thoughts there? Well, what, what would... Alternate the, the amplitude and simulate the, the okay. dots. Well, um, that's related. Uh, if you were to turn a single sideband transmitter on and off, nothing would happen, right? Because you've got to have audio present for single sideband to work. For AM, when you, anytime you're transmitting on AM, the carrier is being transmitted. So you've got RF going out. Even when you are, the RF is going out even, even when you're doing what? Nothing? When you're not speaking. No much. If, when you're not speaking. So the concept right. of turning an AM transmitter on and off uh, you have to be able to send RF power out in order to send CW. Right. So that, that's, that's the simplest form. Good way to check SWR as well. It is, right. Yep, exactly. Yeah, if, if you generate a, a, an AM signal, you can, your SWR meter will work. A lot of transceivers have a method of doing that without needing to go to AM and transmit, but that, that absolutely does work. So the bandwidth for CW is determined by the speed, the, like words per minute, and the keying envelope. We'll have pictures of both of those coming up, or at least the keying envelope. Now there's a standard word, Paris, P-A-R-I-S, and I'll have a slide that demonstrates why that's considered a standard word. And the bandwidth, and here's another one of those crazy formulas, the words per minute times 0.8 times K, where K is 3 to 5, reflecting the abruptness of the keying waveform, more abrupt is larger. Okay, well, I don't really want to remember that. I, I don't know if you do or not, but I don't. Um, so 13 words per minute, the bandwidth, if you take, okay, this, this is the way that you can work it out with, with the formula. The other way is to multiply the words per minute times four. Remember our favorite number four? So what's 13 times four? Well, it's, it's 52. It just happens to work out exact here, but that's uh, not because we, you know, that, it, that, that was an accident, but it, it, it worked out. So here's a little bit more about Paris. It's not the place that we're going to go and visit and catch COVID. Um, it's something else. It's a word in Morse. Okay, so first of all, a word 
in Morse code is five letters. So um, any five character, five letter word or five letter word is considered a, a single word in Morse. The standard word uh, is Paris and the way that that works out, um, if you look at Morse code, you've got the, the fundamental unit is a, a dit or a dot. That's the shortest unit of time measure. So the letter P is dot, da, 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 dit. So the first dit is one. Then we've got a space of one between the two, which is the space of a dit. A da is the equivalent of three dits. And we've got a space. And if in between individual letters uh, with properly sent Morse code, we're going to have the space of three dots. It's a timing thing. Then A is da da. Three spaces. R is da da dit. And when you get all three, all through, when you get to the end of the word, the interword spacing is seven, seven dits, seven dots. So this provides 50 dit, uh, 50 dits of length for the word Paris. And that this is useful for uh, comparison measurements. So if you were to send the word Paris 10 times in one minute, which I believe is uh, down here, Okay, so what, one word per minute, 50 symbols per 60. Okay, they give you a, a, an equivalent baud rate, not that we need it. But if you sent Paris um, five times in one minute, that would be five words per minute. So you can do relative time measurements that way, and that, that's why Paris is kind of a special word. If you sent Paris 10 times in one minute, that would be 10 words per minute. And on up it goes. Of course, that can all be automated for making measurements. A little bit more on PSK bandwidth, phase shift keying. And we mentioned PSK was a very popular keyboard to keyboard mode. When it came out, it just took the amateur radio world by storm. Everybody was using it. And with PSK, you've got 128 character ASCII using Vericode we've talked about. And there's two interesting concepts here, and I've got a diagram coming up for, for this. PSK, pay, I can't talk, PSK bandwidth is minimized by shifting phase precisely at the zero crossing of the RF signal. That's easier to see in a picture. But at the zero crossing point of an RF signal, there's basically no power output at the zero crossing point. So you're not uh, disrupting, uh, you're, you're not doing anything sudden that, that's causing, causing noise in sidebands. And PSK bandwidth is also reduced by using, the, by using sinusoidal data pulses. I'll have a picture of that coming up. But these are two things you'll need to remember. And the other thing, uh, they're going to list a number of digital modes and they're going to ask which one is the narrowest. So of the ones that they ask about, uh, PSK31 will turn out to be the narrowest. The 37.5 hertz uh, bandwidth of a PSK31 signal isn't necessarily the uh, smallest amount of space that a digital mode can, can take up. Um, the FT9 is actually shorter, but FT9 takes up only about 14 hertz. But for the purpose of the answer, it's going to be PSK31. And there's lots and lots of variations. PSK16, PSK125, the, all, all of these different variations. These are different, different modes, but they all uh, operate with phase shift keying, PSK. Now I'll have a diagram. Yeah, here it is. Now here's the concept of zero crossing. When we want to change from a 1 to a 0 with phase shift keying, what we're going to do is wait until we get to the zero crossing point right here where there's no, trans, no, no power being transmitted when we, when we change the phase. So it looks kind of funny here, but here, here's one phase. We're going to reverse the phase by 180 degrees. It's also called binary phase shift keying because it's two states, ones and zeros, and we're shifting the phase by 180 degrees. So every, each if we don't change, if we go one zero zero, there's no difference here, and it just continues in the same phase. 
we go from a zero to, to one, we reverse the phase again and keep it that way for, for two bits. And here we're changing every bit so you can see what's happening there. Now the concept of sinusoidal data pulses, you, here you can see what's happening in, in concept at the zero crossing points. We're also going to, when, when we make that change, we're going to gradually increase and decrease down to the next uh, change point. And this um, sinusoidal shape also causes us to use less bandwidth. Some of these are changing phase and, and some aren't. It's kind of hard to tell from the diagram. Here's zero, one, zero, zero. So going back a slide, now you can, you've got a better connection, I think, to what, what these two things are talking about. PSK bandwidth minimized by shifting the phase precisely at the zero crossing of the RF signal. Bandwidth is also reduced by using the sinusoidal data pulses. Now we'll talk about CW. If you were to send CW like this, you'd be creating all kinds of splatter because a, a very sharp rise time is going to create all kinds of RF noise. You, you remember uh, when we were looking at uh, square waves, we were talking about fast Fourier, Fourier transforms and how a square wave, uh, if we looked at it in the, uh, in the uh, frequency domain, uh, all, all of the spikes that would show up there, well, something very similar happens here. And it'd be generating a, a much more bandwidth if you have a sudden increase. So if we wanted to send a dit, say the dit was, it'd be a fairly long dit, 60 millisecond dit, but we turned on the transmitter and it immediately went to full power from no power that would cause uh, something called key clicks. Proper shaping of a CW waveform looks something like this. You turn the transmitter on somewhat gradually, and then when you lift your key, it comes down more gradually. That greatly reduces the bandwidth. To reduce key, and there's something real easy to get backwards here. To reduce key clicks, increase keying waveform rise and fall times. Now, with, with this one here, you notice it takes some amount of time to go from zero up here. So we're increasing the rise time. Real easy to get that backwards. This is a fast rise time. This is a slower rise time. So we want to increase the keying waveform rise and fall times to get rid of key clicks. And in a radio receiver, you can actually hear the clicking. Absolutely can. If, if you're a, a, a KC or two down from uh, kilohertz, up, up or down from that transmitted signal, you'll just be, hear this thing ticking at, at the rate of the, the keying. And that's a bad thing. So any QST product review that you see will normally give you a picture of the keying waveform. So that this, this is typical. This is your key going up and down. And this, this is the transmitted waveform. You notice there's a slight delay between these edges and what's going on here, a very tiny delay. So every radio that's reviewed in QST will normally have, have that. All right, some questions. Approximate bandwidth of a 13 word per minute Morse code transmission. And what's your secret? Charlie. Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Yep. What factors affect the bandwidth of a transmitted CW signal? C. Charles. Yep. What is the primary effect of an extremely short rise or fall time on CW? Charlie. Yeah, that's our key click. Friend, not really a friend, that's our enemy. What is the most common method of reducing key clicks? And this is the one that's easy to get backwards. A alpha. It is A alpha. Which of the following types of modulation is common below 30 megahertz? If 
If you don't remember this one, you can almost get it by a process of elimination. FSK. That's FSK, frequency shift keying. Correct mm -hmm. spread, spread spectrum is uh, in DTMF is usually used on two meter repeaters and pulse modulation we don't use. What is indicated when one of the ellipses of an FSK display suddenly disappears? Alpha. It's selective fading. You've lost one of them. Your receiver went dead 170 hertz away from, from the marker space uh, frequency. What is the difference between direct FSK and audio FSK? Alpha. Right. Correct. What is the bandwidth of a 170 hertz shift 300 baud ASCII transmission? The answer is Charlie. Okay. The answer is going to be the closest number to four times the shift frequency. See how easy that was? You're supposed to say something now. Yes. Thank you. Right. Ever right. Here's another one. Forget. A alpha. Right. That's the closest to the four times 4,800. Which of these digital modes has the, has the narrowest bandwidth? So of the, one, the ones that are listed, it's PSK31, correct? Why should phase shift keying be done at the zero crossing point? Alpha. Minimize bandwidth, correct? What technique minimize, another technique minimizing the bandwidth? Charlie. Yep, those were our nice rounded pulses. And what does a black screen mean? Does anybody uh, know? know? Are you done? That means we're done. And we got 15 minutes, Ta -da! 15 minutes to spare. So you, you can do whatever you want for the next 15 minutes. We'll ask if there's any, any questions. And next week we're going to, to be doing the second half of chapter eight. And we'll be talking about uh, packet, packet radio uh, to wrap up the, the mode section and then we'll be getting into amateur TV. And that's, that's, if you've never been into the theory of how that works, that will be very interesting because the way broadcast TV used to work before digital TV came out is uh, going to be the, the lion's share of the material that we'll be covering. And there's quite a few pool questions relating to TV. You might never use TV, but uh, amateur TV, but you, you need to know this so that you can handle the pool questions. And we all want you to pass with 100% if possible. All right, with that, we'll close it off. And we'll see you next week. Everybody go Thank home. You, Dave. Oh, yep. Wait a minute, you're already home. You're already home, yeah. Get on. <laughs> At least I hope you are. All right, good night, all. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Have